It's a beautiful day outside. Very peaceful and calm. You can hear the birds occasionally. And the fountain in the garden. Where the fish are swimming under the lily pads. And as we sit here in the study together, in complete relaxation, it's perfect time to have a look at one of our ancient historian authors. Herodotus. Herodotus, Persian Wars. We're going to be reading a little bit from Book 8 about the Battle of Salamis, the famous naval victory of the Greeks over the larger and more imposing Persian fleet. I'll prepare a pretty paper with some watercolour and write out a part of Book 8, Chapter 90 in the Greek as we hear about Herodotus' history and the battle of Salamis. And then we'll thank our patrons for the month of May. So breathe easy, relax, and come with me into the study. citizen of Suri in modern Calabria, Italy. He is probably most famous for his histories, a detailed account of the Greco-Persian Wars, which was written about 430 BC in Ionic classical Greek. It is an account that is more systematic than any known to have preceded it, and as a result is considered to be a founding work of Western history and literature. And so Herodotus is therefore often referred to as the father of history, after Cicero's assessment. Here you can see a 15th century paper manuscript that contains the first book of his histories. 
and there are even notes in the margins in Greek and Latin, languages used for scholarship and erudition from the classical times onward to about the 19th century. This paper manuscript is now to be found in the Harley Collection, one of the foundation collections of the British Library. Herodotus' histories contain a treasure trove of information for the modern scholar about the traditions, politics, and geography of his world, as well as the interactions between cultures of Greece, Western Asia, and Northern Africa. It is one of the earliest accounts of the rise of the Persian Empire and the events leading to the wars between the Persian Empire and the Greek city-states in the 5th century BC. It was perhaps this portrayal of the conflict as one between the forces of slavery, the Persians, and those of freedom, i.e. the Athenians, and the loose confederacy of Greek city-states united against the invaders, although how united they actually were is still up for debate. This gave impetus and form to the Enlightenment ethos of the 18th century that came to be so ingrained in the psyche of the Western world. Freedom from slavery, unity, brotherhood. The histories are commonly divided into nine books, named after the Nine Muses, and they primarily cover the lives of prominent kings and famous battles, including, but not limited to, Marathon, Thermopylae, Artemisium, Salamis, and Plataea. As in all pieces of earlier literature, Herodotus' histories contains legend and fantasy, which by today's standard of the discrete separation of fact from fiction might stir criticism or diminish the veracity and dignity of the history it aspires to relate. Herodotus certainly recorded everything he heard, asking everyone he met about every little thing, it seems, and then recording it for all to enjoy. But even in his own time, Thucydides would accuse him of making up stories, just for entertainment. Considering today's social media frenzy and the loss of the integrity of journalism, we can truly say, plus ça change. Nevertheless, there is much merit in Herodotus' work, and we continue to this day to learn from it. The Persian Wars were essentially a prolonged conflict between what is now modern Greece and Turkey, or the Greek city-states, and the Persian Empire. It took place between 429 and 449 BC, consisting of two large, significant Persian invasions, and incursions into the Greek homeland, and a series of battles, now legendary. By and large, the Persian Empire wanted to consolidate the integrity of their western borders, which were populated by Greeks. These Greeks, in Ionia and Asia Minor, rebelled against the Persians 
who were often seen as tyrants, and would take away their freedoms as Greek citizens. These regions received support from Athens and Eretria, and the conflict escalated into an all-out Persian invasion, with many costly battles, acts of heroism, and crushing defeats, changing alliances, and military skill. We will look at Book 8, and then I'll read a bit from Herodotus, of his account of the Battle of Salamis. Book 8 is named after the muse of astronomy, Orania. Orania is a goddess of the stars, her attributes being the globe and the compass. Book 8 tells first about how the Greek fleet is led by Eurybiades, a Spartan commander, who leads the Greek fleet after a meeting at the Isthmus in 481 BC. There's destruction of 200 ships by a storm that were sent to block the Greeks from escaping. And then we hear about the retreat of the Greek fleet after a word of the defeat at Thermopylae. There's an account of a supernatural rescue of Delphi from a Persian attack and the subsequent evacuation of Athens that is assisted by the Greek fleets. A reinforcement of the Greek fleet at Salamis Island brought the total ships to 378, according to Herodotus. Then is related the destruction of Athens by the Persian land force, after their difficulties with those who remained to defend it. Next is the Battle of Salamis, the Greeks being joined by the Athenian evacuation fleet and, due to better organization, the Greeks suffered fewer losses. Also, they were able to swim, what something the Persians apparently weren't able to do. There's a description of the Angarum, the Persian riding post, and a rise in favor of the Queen Artemisia who turned on her own allies to escape destruction at Salamis. She was a queen or woman commander, and Xerxes even decided that he favoured her for her actions. So there is a counsel to Xerxes in favour of returning to Persia. Then we hear of the vengeance of Hermotimus, Xerxes' chief eunuch, against Panionius. The attack on Andros by Themistocles, the Athenian fleet commander, and perhaps the most valiant Greek at Salamis. Next is the escape of Xerxes and how he left behind 300,000 picked troops under Mardonius in Thessaly. Then we have the ancestry of Alexander I of Macedon, and an account of the refusal of an attempt by Alexander to seek a Persian alliance with Athens.
Salamis took place in September 480 BC in the Saronic Gulf and is regarded as one of the most important naval conflicts in ancient history. The Greek fleet had much smaller numbers than the Persian fleet, though the Greeks won through strategy. The trireme of the Greeks was fast and easy to maneuver. It had a bronze ram at the front designed to break the enemy boats. The Greeks coaxed the Persians into the narrow straits of Salamis, where their ships would be easier to ram and destroy. Because of their greater numbers, the Persians had no room to maneuver out of the straits and were stuck in the narrow area where the Greeks could batter them. They had nowhere to retreat and found themselves trapped being broken up, their fleet was picked off one by one, and many of the Persian sailors drowned. Have a read of Herodotus' account in Book 8. start at chapter 83, where the Greeks have just heard of the fleet that's coming, and Athens has just been evacuated by Themistocles' fleet. The Greeks, believing at last the tale of the Tanians, made ready for battle. It was now earliest dawn, and they had called the fighting men to an assembly, wherein Themistocles made an harangue in which he excelled all others. The tenor of his words was to array all the good in man's nature and his state against the evil, and having exhorted them to choose the better, he made an end speaking and bade them to embark. Even as they so did, came the trireme from Aegina, which had been sent away for the sons of Aicus. With that, the Greeks stood out to sea in full force, and as they stood out, the foreigners straightway fell upon them. The rest of the Greeks began to back water and beach their ships, but Aminias of Palene, an Athenian, pushed out to the front and charged a ship, which, being entangled with his, and the two not able to be parted, the others did now come to Aminias' aid and joined the battle. 
This is the Athenian story of the beginning of the fight. But the Aegeanians say that the ship which began it was that one which had been sent away to Aegina for the sons of Aeacus. This story is also told that they saw the vision of a woman who cried commands loud enough for all Greek fleet to hear, uttering first this reproach. Sirs, what madness is this? How long will you still be back in water? The Phoenicians, for they had the western wing towards Eleusis, were arrayed opposite to the Athenians and to the Lacedaemonians, the Ionians on the eastern wing nearest to Piraeus. Yet but few of them fought slackly as Themistocles had bidden them, and the more part did not so. Many names I could record of the ship's captains that took Greek ships, but I will speak of none save Theomestor, son of Androdamus, and Phylacus, son of Histeus, Samians both. And I make mention of these alone, because Theomestor was, for this feat of arms, made by the Persians despot of Samos. And Phylacus was recorded among the king's benefactors, and given much land. These benefactors of the king are called in the Persian language Orosangai. Thus it was with these two, but the great multitude of the ships were shattered at Salamis, some destroyed by the Athenians, and some by the Aegeanians. For since the Greeks fought orderly and in array, but the foreigners were by now disordered, and did not of set purpose, it was but reason that they should come to such an end as befell them. Yet on that day they were, and approved themselves by far better men than of Euboea. All were zealous and feared Xerxes, each man thinking that the king's eye was on him. Now, as touching some of the others, I cannot with exactness say how they fought severally, foreigners or Greeks. But what befell Artemisia made her to be esteemed by the king even more than before. The king's side being now in dire confusion, Artemisia's ship was at this time being pursued by a ship of Attica and she could not escape, for other friendly ships were in her way, and it chanced that she was the nearest to the enemy. Wherefore she resolved that she would do that which afterwards tended to her advantage, and as she fled, pursued by the Athenian, she charged a friendly ship that bore men of Calindus and the king himself of that place. Demasthenus. It may be that she had some quarrel with him while they were still at the Hellespont, but if her deed was done of set purpose, or if the Calindian met her by crossing her path at haphazard, I cannot say. But 
having charged and sunk the ship, she had the good luck to work for herself a double advantage. For when the attic captain saw her charge a ship of foreigners, he supposed that Artemisia's ship was Greek, or a deserter from the foreigners fighting for the Greeks, and he turned aside to deal with others. By this happy chance it came about that she escaped and avoided destruction, and moreover the upshot was that very harm which she had done won her great favour in Xerxes' eyes. For the king, it is said, saw her charge the ship as he viewed the battle. And one of the bystanders said, Sire, see you, Artemisia, how well she fights, and how she has sunk an enemy ship. Xerxes then asking if it were truly Artemisia that had done the deed, they affirmed it, knowing well the ensign of her ship, and they supposed that the ship she had sunk was an enemy, for the luckiest chance of all, which had, as I have said, befallen her, was that not one from the Calindian ship was saved alive to be her accuser. Hearing what they told him, Xerxes is reported to have said, My men have become women, and my women men. Such, they say, were his words. Sorry, I was a bit distracted writing this out, and sometimes I had to sound out the words to make sure they were correct, and I made a few mistakes. So, apologies to those of you reading along. I did have a garden incident that I had to stop and deal with halfway through. But, um... We've got a nice little Greek fashion dry ring there with a beak, a, a ram, and some oarsmen, and these stars in the sky. And I hope it was very relaxing. And I was thinking as I went out to deal with the garden 
the birds and the fountain, the fish, that perhaps I should do a video sometime that incorporates something in the garden, in addition to being here in the study. If you think you would like something like that, with some water splashing noises, cutting flowers, and a few bits and pieces outside, do let me know in the comments below. I do really like to hear what you think, um, what you would like, and questions are always welcome, as are suggestions. And, and I would like to thank all of our patrons of this study, everyone who so kindly has supported the study on coffee, by subscribing, and on Patreon. So I'd like to now thank our special patrons from the Patreon website. I'm going to write your names as well as I can in ancient Greek. And we have quite a few patrons and some of them, some of the names different um, origins, linguistic origins. So I tried to use the best um, pronunciation I could from the ancient Greek alphabet. Um, and in some cases sort of make an amalgam of what it might have sounded like um, with these sounds, as well as what a uh, modern sound would be. So, let's see how we go. So we have Ben Ben, very nice sounding name. Thank you, thank you. And this one was a little tough, but uh, we'll try that. Bernie. Bernie. Thank you. Thank you. And we have two names with ancient origin, but not Greek. Beautifully pronounced David in older languages and David today. So our patrons, I've kind of made, um, again, a combined modern and ancient spelling here, and we'll go with David, David B, and M. So, to David B. Thank you. Thank you. And David M. Thank you. And 
here's another very interesting one. Oh, patron. Right. And Omicron. Joshua, and I've used an Iota there, Joshua, Joshua, thank you, thank you, and now, this one will be fun because I had to use a diphthong, because even though we might say the Greeks were some of the early pirates. I think the modern word pirate really deserves its own pronunciation. So I've got an I there for pirate. And then an R, because all pirates must have an R. So, and there we have, um, a little more ancient. Let's see if we can get this one. Romulus. Romulus. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting one. So we have the the um the and here I'm thinking there I'm not sure if I should use an A. Sojourn into Herodotus and the Battle of Salamis. Be good to yourself, my friend. Be kind to others. And be extraordinary.